Dear friends, I would like you to follow me if you are not afraid of my English. In a series of discussion on macular edema and its surgical treatment. Let's see first a problem that is so common, the idiopathic epipetal membrane. And I would like to start by asking this question, which is for me crucial, as I think that this idea of considering the epipetal membrane as a disease inducing a visual loss has been, for many of us, responsible for misunderstanding on what is really a membrane. It is true that we often say to the patient, you have a visual loss due to an epipetal membrane and we have to remove it, as we would say for a cataract. It is true that the metamorphopsia are due to the membrane contraction and this is confirmed by the fact that they decrease immediately after surgery. But in no case the visual loss can be due to the presence of the membrane. We have all seen very thick membrane with superb reflections with 2020 vision and on the contrary, very thin membrane, barely visible in OCT with collapsed acuities. None of us can imagine that, as for a cataract, it is the physical opacity of the membrane that stops the progression of the photons, and the fact that the removal of the membrane does not allow an immediate restoration of the vision confirms that it is not the explanation for the visual loss. The membrane, therefore, appears more as a revealing process, a consequence, or an accompanying sign more or less important of a retinal pathological process at the origin of the visual loss. But then, what is commonly called an idiopathic epipetal membrane? Certainly, as we have just seen, it is not a disease. It is a structure that we recognize either by OCT or thanks to the reflections it emits, reflections that are not professional to the patient's function discomfort. When accompanied by the visual loss, this structure is always associated with an edema located in the outer layers of the retina. It seems, therefore, that it is rather the edema that is responsible for the visual loss. We'll talk about that later on. Other signs may be present, such as uh, vascular tortuosity, retinal folds, or fovea ectopia, often related to metamorphopsia or pseudomacular hole. But this does not tell us what an idiopathic membrane is made of. And here I am obliged to remind you the work that I did in 1987 with my wife Yvette, who is pathologist. She published this work in the French Ophthalmic Society report directed by Jean O. At that time, I was already systematically removing the ILM whose reflection I could see thanks to the slit lamp illumination of the operating microscope. In fact, I noticed that, doing so, I had much higher visual improvement than those mentioned in the literature. I sent her 56 specimens of membrane for analyzing using anti-collagen antibody type 1, 2, 3 and 4, anti-vementime antibody, anti-protein 100 antibody, S100 antibody, anti-cytokeratine antibody, and anti-GFAP antibody. In all these 56 specimens, Yvette could find only three structures. SLLR 
collagen 2 fibers corresponding to posterior hyaluronic remnants, the ILM, a collagen 4 acellular structure, and the gliosis. We are talking about gliosis when glial cells multiply and become fulfilled by microfilaments of GFAP. In the retina, there are mainly two kinds of glial cells. Astrocytes, which in a normal retina are in a quiescent state and connected to vessels below the ILM, and Muller cells, spread vertically from the ILM to the ELM. But contrary to what was admitted at the time, apart from rare yellow sites, inflammatory cells or RP cells exceptionally encountered, these glial cells were the only cellular contingent found. And it is important to say that in a normal retina, glial cells are not charged with GFAP. There is no gliosis. We then try to make an anatomoclinical correlation according to what we could remove and were able to individualize two different scenarios. Either I could remove separately a preretinal structure and then, in a second step, the ILM. It was the case for this eye where a PVD was being done, the posterior haloid was stretched as a drum head and was sectioned to discover through the haloidal window the typical reflection of the glial proliferation that was dissected in a second time. The first structure exhibited the characteristic of a normal posterior haloid in scanning electron microscopy such an, as in immunohistochemistry, GFAP negative and collagen 2 positive. The second structure was an ILM modified by glial proliferation, collagen 2 almost negative because <coughs> some hyaluronic fibers remain adherent and GFAP positive. Either I could remove both structures at the same time. This was the case of this eye where an attempt was made to create a plane of cleavage with a curved needle before separating the membrane with a form oak and then removing it with a forceps. The specimens were analyzed. On one side of the specimen, the typical appearance of a normal posterior haloid was clearly identified. And on the other side of the same specimen, an internal limiting membrane modified by glial proliferation. Both collagen 2 and GFAP immunohistochemical specification were found because the two structures were so adherent that they came away together. The idiopathic membrane is not therefore a proliferative process made of cells foreign to the vitro retinal interface spreading over the retinal surface but, on the contrary, it is a structure composed of a mixture of posterior haloid and retinal gliosis in contact with the ILM. Confirmation can be given by Yvette's unique opportunity to examine an eye eviscerated for anterior segment problem that had an epiretinal membrane. In the standard HES staining, we see numerous cellular elements covering the retinal surface and giving the impression of a membrane composed of cells foreign from, from the retina. However, GFAP staining reveals that all this cell proliferation is composed exclusively of retinal gliosis coming from the inner layers of the retina. In fact, 
the glial proliferation, when it enters the hyoid fibers, changes the structure of their arrangement, which emits the reflection perceived by the observer, as happens when the corneal lamellae are swollen by an edema. The configuration and importance of the reflections that will be seen with the biomicroscope will therefore depend on the respective importance of the hyoid fiber and the glial proliferation. The more fiber and glial proliferation, the more reflective the membrane will be. In contrast, if there is no fiber and no glial proliferation, there will be an aspect of pure edema. In practice, several conditions of occurrence can be individualized. In a first configuration, there is no PVD when occurs the initiated stimulus of gliosis. The very dense reflections in this eye are related to an adherent posterior haloid that will be dissected with a curved needle. Taking off the haloid from the underlying tissue makes the reflection disappear. To avoid exert interaction at the vitreous base, it is decided to remove the hyaluronid with a vitrectomy handpiece and limit its ablation only at the posterior pole. The injection of Kuma C. Brian Blue that follows will allow us to see that the removal of the posterior haloid has caused a tear of the eye limb. We start the peeling from this eye limb flap and then we turn around the macula. Close to this configuration, we can include this case where there is a PVD but with a vitroschisis. In this case, where the posterior haloid is eaten first with the prepapillary ring, the injection of Kuma C. Brian Blue that follows allows to see that only a microscopic island of ILM is colored by the blue of Kumasi. We try to start the dissection from this small area, but unfortunately, it is not large enough to allow it. And we confirm by the following dissection tests with the forceps that the rest of the posterior pole is well covered by the hyoid fibers attached to the underlying astrocytic proliferation without a well marked plan of cleavage. These cases are not the most common. In both cases, collagen fibers are very abundant. The glial proliferation is trans essentially astrocytic one, cross the ILM and proliferate under the posterior haloid, causing significant or even very important reflections depending on the intensity of these gliosis. In a second configuration, there is a PVD, which leaves plaques of collagen fibers on the macula. These plaques can be single or scattered in small islands. These plaques, invaded by glial proliferation, show much more glare than adjacent areas. This is the situation most frequently encountered, I would say in about two cases out of three. 
and this case is very interesting. It is clear that the Kuma Brian Blue has colored all the posterior pole except this haloid plaque which appears in negative with on its nasal edge a very colored collar detached from the ilem seat of an intense astrocytic proliferation on its external face. The haloid plaque bordered by this glial proliferation is detached without any particular difficulty and the Kumasi Brian Blue is re-injected to find out whether behind this plaque the ILM and the glial cells are present. Admittedly, the area of interest is less colored than the rest, which has received two successive coloration, but as can be proved during the dissection, the entire zone is well covered by an intact ILM in continuity with the adjacent one and mixed with the glial proliferation. We can distinguish a third rare situation, a variant of the previous one, but important to know in terms of surgery. Where the glial proliferation is so strong that it extends well beyond the plaque centrifugally towards the, the temporal arcades while covering the ilium. This was the case of this previously cited eye eviscerated for anterior segment problem, where it is clear that the retinal gliosis located just below the ilem crossed the ilem, spread under and on the adherent haloid plaque and proliferated above the ilem centrifugally. This situation is important to know because the proliferation has the same coloring properties as the ILM1. This may induce the surgeon to think that the ILM has been removed when in reality only the preretal gliosis was taken off. It was the case for this patient where a first structure colored by Kumasi Brian Blue and centered by a harried plaque, simulated the image that can be given by an ILM around a central plaque. In fact, a reinjection of Kumasi Brian Blue shows that the ILM had not been removed and that the first membrane was indeed a preretinal plaque of astrocytic proliferation. The fourth situation is when the vitreous detachment has left very little or no fibers on the retinal surface. The gliosis will that, thus emit only very weak cellophane reflections and we will have OCT and biomicroscopic aspect very similar to that of a macular edema. In fact, the difference between an idiopathic epirital membrane and a pure macular edema is the presence or the absence of adherent hyoid cortex. Here, except for small reflections we see towards the temporal vessels and that will be removed at the same time during the ilm rexis, Nothing can separate this case from a pure macular edema. Finally, there is a clinical picture that must be evoked here the vitreo macular traction syndrome that everyone tries to identify as an isolated disease. 
although I cannot prove it. A simple explanation for me would be that glial proliferation penetrates the hyaluronic fibers before the vitreous detachment is formed. There are then three possibilities. Either the traction exerted by the movements of the vitreous tear the hyaluronic around the glial attachment. We then return to the situation number two of epiretinal membrane in plaque. This helps to explain why there are so many configurations in plaques. In fact, it seems unlikely that a normal PVD leaves macular plaques in 80% of the cases. Either the traction exerted by the movement of the vitreous tear off the vitreous plaque and the corresponding internal limiting membrane. And it would be in this case where we found this spontaneous healing traction syndrome with not only a cessation of the traction but also the visual improvement related to the removal of the ILM. Or the retinal grip of the hairy traction is strong and then a vitreomacular traction syndrome appears. Everything seems to be clearer now, but it remains to be understood on, the, on one hand what is the stimulus that generates this glial proliferation, essentially astrocytic one, which penetrates into the fibers of the hyaluronic, and, on the other hand, why the removal of the ILM is so beneficial in the visual recovery. This is what we'll be seeing in the next chapter.